Hello and welcome to Politics on Sunday. My name is Femi Akonde. Today on the program, we're talking about promoting social accountability and also the latest report by the National Bureau of Statistics that says Nigeria's population, more than 60% of Nigeria's population are poor. My guest is the Chief Executive of Connected Development, Hamza Lawa. Welcome to the program, sir. Thank you for having me. Yes, let's start with um, the latest poverty report and you know you your job is um, empowering communities and all of that how did it come to you when you had that report more than 60 about 63 percent of the population are poor i was not surprised when the report came out that 130 or over 130 million people were poor uh, during covid 19 when we checked the poverty clock the world poverty clock and we trickled down to Nigeria. At that time, it was over 80 million people that were poor. But during COVID-19, and I had this debate with some of my colleagues and say with co the impact of COVID-19 and with the fact that unemployment rate is now at over 30%, then you will have more poor people, you know, join, you know, this poverty line. And when I saw this data, at least it has now also uh, showed that my argument was, was strong. But then, it would now help government to plan effectively. And probably, you know, the government of the day would rethink their strategy in bringing 100 million people out of, uh, out of poverty. Yeah, so uh, would we put uh, most of the blame on COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19, or lack of creativity on the part of government or their ineffective um, policies targeted at um, reducing poverty? So. I think all of us have a fair share of the blame. I'll tell you why. So when you look at the social investment program, because programs like this and with the amount of investment that went into social investment, so the trader money, the market uh, money, uh, the conditional cash transfer, uh, the homegrown school feeding program, you know, this initiative are meant to reduce poverty and empower people and ensure that there's a lot of uh, cash flow in the economy. Uh, and then when you also look at the impact of COVID-19 and how we've been in and out of recession, you know, for the past four years. Uh, all of this have impacted, you know, people passing the poverty line and, and being in multi-dimensional poverty. But I say we must also share part of the blame because see, uh, what did we do before now? How did we hold government to account? How did we ensure that government judiciously used these resources? Is anyone auditing how the social investment uh, funds were utilized? What was the impact of these funds? You know, are there needs assessment targeted before they launch this program? You know, so, so we should not blame government alone because government of the day did not become government on our own. It is the people that elected them into office and the people should not have uh, uh, you know, left government to do whatever they want to do. No, the people should have held government to account, and probably, you know, there will be more answers, and we won't be this. You know, things would not be this bad. Yes, you're talking about holding the government to account. The people do, and sometimes through civil society organisation. So the blame too could also be on the part of civil society organisations. Well, that's why I say all of us have a fair share. I'm not exonerating myself and other civil society group. Yeah. You know, uh, when they were doing campaigns. I had 2015 and also I had 2019. They made campaign promises to create millions of jobs, you know, to revitalize the economy, you know, to, to invest in infrastructure, you know, to, to create opportunities for young people and ease of doing business and whatnot. So, yes, we all have a fair share of the, including the media. Yeah. Well, um, the next election is just around the corner. What kind of conversation now should we be having? How do we change um, this narrative to ensure that uh, the politicians understand our reality in Nigeria, 130 million people living below the poverty line, and come up with plans and programs that can indeed lift these people out of poverty in real terms? You know, as we go into the 2023 general election, they've been exciting conversation both online and offline. I'm optimistic, but I'm not carried away with the noise. You know, I say the noise because when you look at the conversation, there are no substance around issues. Sadly, some people are still telling the ethnic religion uh, bias and, uh, you know, and regional biases. But when you look deep down, we're not different. You go to the north, go to the south, the east and the west. 
we're all collectively affected by the same things and the same issues. But the sad reality is, yes, there have been some increase in civic participation and conversation. And even if you look at the voter register, there have been you know, millions of people who uh, are excited to vote for the first time. But, but for me, why are we not interrogating the manifesto of the political parties and the candidates? Some candidates and political parties have a manifesto. Some up to this moment, they don't have a manifesto. And we have less than 90 days into the polls. You know, it's going to be in February, the presidential election, and then March, you have the, the governorship election. So, so for me, I'm optimistic, but I'm not carried away by all the noise and the shenanigans. Yeah, when you say uh, the noise, how do we ensure that um, the issues that matter are what um, dominate the conversation that um, these politicians are having with the citizens? I think this is where civil society and the media needs to work together because it is the media and civil society that sets agenda for the politicians and the political party. And if you look at the conversation and various town hall meetings, you know, it has been, you know, mainstreamed and it has been streamed by the media. So the media has the power and the tool to reach millions of people. Civil society have data. They have the goodwill and the shared trust of the Nigerian people. You know, the Nigerian people will listen to civil society more than their government representative because of the values that this government brings into governance. So I believe this is a gap that needs to be filled by civil society and the media to interrogate this um, so-called manifesto and even check, is this realistic in nature? See, Nigeria does not need a leader to manage her resources. Which resources do you want to manage? Where governors cannot pay salary? Where we're, we're literally you know, begging that we should remove for a subsidy, if not, we'll all be on our knees, you know? So Nigeria needs a leader who can mobilize resources, who can mobilize talent, who can bring value, who can bring respect, who can build confidence and show trust. Because you see, I say this because see, we can have billions of dollars, but if you don't have a leader who can mobilize people, who can assemble the best team, who can build confidence. By the way, the Nigerian people, we were, lo we we're losing trust every day. The people do not trust their government and their representatives. So you need trust because trust is a rallying point. Because whatever policy that would happen, it must be led by campaign. And without trust, you cannot lead a campaign that gives a buy-in of everyone. Because see, in a democracy, we, we can't leave anyone behind. People with disability, women, young people, even the older people. So for me, I believe that the media and the civil society, they need to work together. Let's look at these manifestos. Let's have a series of conversation and town hall meeting and rejig and, and turn the tides. You know, we need to flip the script and bring an agenda based on issues so that these candidates would come and answer a salient question. But most importantly, we can document this process and hold them to account in the Constitution. The media is recognized. What are these issues? Healthcare. When you look at maternal mortality and newborn, it's on the rise in Nigeria. Education. Today we have over 20 million out of school children. Before 2015, the data shows that it was over 10 million. Now you have over 20 million. So what was the impact of the homegrown, homegrown school feeding program? And to be fair, I did an assessment in Kano. And I saw firsthand where they were giving nutritious meal and where the head teacher confirmed to me that they've been increasing enrollment over 100%. But then again, that's only in Kano I got this assessment. So I can give you an assessment of all the schools. But if you have over 20 million out of school children, then it tells that maybe there's something we're doing wrong and that's something we need to do right Some and better. Some people have said that insecurity could have contributed to the increase in the number of out of school children. So why is there insecurity? What's the, what's the, what's the uh, root cause of insecurity? You see, I did not mention insecurity first. You know why? When you provide safety net for people, they have no reason to take arms against the state. When you provide you know, safety nets where people can you know, get jobs, where they can get v wages, uh, uh, salary, where you know, they, they can ensure they're not double, they, do, they don't pay double tax, where they don't pay out of pocket when they want to access health care, when they know that you know, their kids would get free and quality timely education, then people don't have to go into kidnapping or armed robbery or other you know, social vices in the country. So, and, and when people also feel included, see, inclus inclusion is big. And see, we're a country with diverse, uh, you know, diverse background. 
and and you you, you know you, you you cannot sideline any part of Nigeria because each and every one of us is a stakeholder to Project Nigeria. So so for me, these are the issues. If you tackle these issues head on, insecurity will be the order of the day. It 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 will take the back seat. Let people feel safe. Let there be safety net, healthcare, education, jobs, infrastructure. Provide trust. Build trust amongst people from you know bottom up to top bottom. And let's have justice. You know, with justice and equity, things would would take shape. Not anarchy. Not impunity. Life is politics in Nigeria. Almost every part of our lives is touched by the politics we play. Governance, legislative matters, the economy, security, foreign affairs, internal affairs. Have a feel as strategic plays in the political space determine how we live in Nigeria. The players, the drama, chess piece moves. Be kept informed. Watch analysis of major happenings in the political space and how it affects you. Watch Politics on Sunday. The 2023 election will be uh, the biggest in Nigeria's um, democratic history. Uh, but let's look at the electoral umpire now. How have they matured over the years um, to get to that point that um, citizens can have confidence in them to carry out a credible election that the outcome will be acceptable by all. You know who gives me hope in this election is INEC. I'm really excited about how INEC have been responsive. But most importantly, and you know I must give credit to President Muhammad Buhari. He signed the 2022 amendment into law, which gives INEC full autonomy as an election body to really manage and pro ensure that they provide a free fair, you know, Free, you know, free, fair, elect, credible election to the Nigerian people. I'm confident with the leadership of INEC and the management of INEC. I'm confident that they can deliver on this. And if you look, the perception around INEC is positive. The Nigerian people trust INEC. And with the integration of beavers, with electronic transmission of results, integrating technology into it, come on. You know, INEC have really done well and have learned, you know, from successive, you know, elections. In the Kenya presidential election, a team from INEC was in Nairobi to observe that election. Uh, we also deployed observers. You know, we met, uh, you know, the INEC chairman and his team on the ground, and we we shared notes. And even when we came back and there was a civil society roundtable, we shared our experience and some of our takeaways. And for me, one of my call to INEC is they need to look at the election guideline. They need to increase the hours of voting. So in Kenya, for instance. Uh, the polls open by seven, as early as 7 a.m. and it closed around 5 a.m. INEX registers about 21 million. Today, you know, plus or minus, you have over 90 million. Yes, they're still cleaning up the data, but it will be over 90 million in our register. But we open the polls around 9 a.m. and it closed by 2 p.m. So for me, you know, we cannot disenfranchise people. Like you said, a lot of people are excited. They want to go cast their ballot and they hope that it will be free and fair. But you need to give time. Because if you have millions of people troop out, and for me, I believe this election, there will be less voter ap apathy. A lot of people will come out uh, because now they understand that the power in our democracy is in the hands of the people. So this is my advocacy call to whining. Yeah, let's review your, uh, your guidelines and let's give more hours to the Nigerian people and insist that you know, technology is integrated. And for the politicians to not interfere in the role of INEC, our role is uh, her role is democratic, her role is constitution, constitutional, and you know, politicians should, should stop dictating and interfering uh, and stop all these fevereous court cases and trying to take us back. Come on, we've made progress in our electoral law uh, and processes. That the blame, world will you, blame, will you blame politicians for that or the judiciary? No, no, no. So if you have effective internal party democracy, judiciary will not interfere. It is because, and when you look at the political party primary, it was more about money exchanging hands. You know, it was more about subverting, uh, uh, you, you know, candidates. And you see the case of uh, Yobe, for instance, you know, where the current Senate president tried to, to you know, maneuver the process. So that's why judi judiciary is not supposed to play any role. 
but because there is lack of internal party democracy. And that's why I agree people would always go to court. And then the court decides, come on, a society where courts decide who lead people, then people will not trust you know, the person who lead them. And, and sometimes you know, no, no system is perfect. You know? So politicians should stop interfering. Let's have stronger internal party democracy, but most importantly, they should not interfere in the role, the constitutional role of INEC. I trust, and the Nigerian people trust and believe that INEC can uphold on her mandate and deliver you know, their campaign or the electional process. So would you say the um, February 25th date for election is sacrosanct? Because some people are saying with um, the level of insecurity, we have seen attacks on INEC offices and it appears that still security agencies are not complementing INEC's effort to provide that um, credible election. Maybe they cannot um, create that peaceful or guarantee that peaceful atmosphere. So do you think uh, INEC might consider no, INEC should not shift any grounds. You know, we, we saw the impact of changing the dates of election in 2019, which also uh, brought about voter apathy. I remember at that time we had even deployed over 5,000 people to the field. We had to call them back. This took a lot of resources and, and manpower. The failure of the current administration is why we have insecurity. You know. INEC is playing her role. Yes, I know there's a joint committee of, of security agencies working with uh, INEC, but I think that you know, we need to now start gathering intelligence using technology and working with people in this community. Come on, we all know ourselves. If there are you know, movements that are questionable, we should raise red flag. And, and technology and satellite imagery have made things easier. I believe that the Nigerian security architecture or the Nigerian security agencies or forces have what it takes to tackle the security. I think what is the missing link is political will and giving them the needed resources to, to tackle insecurity heads on. INEC is playing her role. Let's allow security agencies play their role. We cannot play politics with security. No, you can't do that. There are issues you don't play with. Security is one. And today, sadly, our politicians are playing politics with security. No. You, and these are the consequences. We cannot have an election that will be postponed or shift for any reason. No. It will roll back on the successes that we've achieved. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of civic engagement and participation. No, we, we shouldn't even buy the idea that the election will be shifted or postponed for any reason. 2023 is a transition. It's a historic moment that we must transition. Either within the party or outside the party, President Muhammad Buhari will have to leave office in May, and the country would have a new leader who takes us, hopefully, to greater heights. Well, that's been our conversation with Hamza Lawal, an anti-corruption activist, founder, follow the money, and chief executive of Connected Development. Thank you for your time on the program. My name is Femi Akonde.